Is lung transplant a possibility for a recovered COVID patient? Yeah, that's a, um, a question in evolution. And, you know, currently the, our knowledge of this disease and its long-term outcomes is still very uh, limited. Mm -hmm. And it's only been in humans for under a year that we know of. And so we don't know what the natural history of it is. We don't know what the recovery pattern is. We don't know um, whether it is similar to other acute lung injuries where the recovery might be on the order of six months or a year, but eventually patients are able to, to recover function. Um, but that said, uh, to date, there have been lung transplants performed uh, initially in uh, China. And most recently now, there have been two performed in the United States um, and within the last month, in fact, one within the last few days. And so it is something that is currently being uh, evaluated here at Keck. We have not performed any lung transplants for COVID, but we have evaluated several patients and continue to evaluate patients with COVID-19 that have recovered from the acute infection uh, in that they are no longer considered infected, but have had damage to their lungs severe enough that we do not expect that to resolve. And so we have had patients who we are evaluating that for, and um, we will be considering the very selected patient for a lung transplant in the future. That said, we just don't know enough as to whether this will be a durable therapy or if this is just like everything else, we're kind of learning as we go. Is Would you say that that's one of the benefits of an academic medical center? Could you, you know, or do you think that they're exploring those options in the community or, or what is it here maybe that that we can offer where maybe others um, can? Yeah, great, great question. So yes, yeah, short answer is yes, that is the advantage of an academic medical center. You know, there are only, uh, you know, a handful, less than five uh, transplant, lung transplant centers here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to even be considered or evaluated, you need to be seen in one of those centers. Now that said, um, we have our community here. And so we've been in contact with those other centers and we're all kind of in the same in the same boat, so to speak, which is that we are all considering patients for transplant. We're evaluating them as we would any other individual with an acute lung injury. And we're very carefully selecting those patients who might be appropriate. Um, if patients in the community are, uh, when we have received, we have received many referrals for these individuals in the community to come to Keck to undergo this evaluation. We always are happy to evaluate them now via telehealth <laughs> and with these remote platforms we can get a lot of information on folks even in remote locations um, or remote institutions and bring them here when appropriate to to do these higher level evaluations that aren't available elsewhere that's incredible and here's another question that um, again this is one that we hear quite a bit and I'm sure you guys hear it more than I do um, I've heard that ventilators can harm patients why are they used? Um, the, the ventilator itself doesn't harm the patient. It's more that the illness that requires the ventilator has an effect on the patient mm -hmm. that's using it. Um, but ventilators are needed when the patient alone can't get enough oxygen or can't take enough a deep enough breath without the ventilator to perform the needed lung functions. And those functions are mainly bringing oxygen in and getting rid of carbon dioxide. So the, the ventilator in this scenario can, or the scenario of COVID-19, if it's needed, can help improve that gas exchange. That's, uh, again, really helpful. That's, that's one of the ones that, you know, even just in my walking around thinking about it, you just, you hear about people on ventilators and is that the best way and, and is that harmful itself? But it sounds like it's not the actual ventilator. I have one more, one more question and we can, we can wrap up. Um, I've read a lot about, in the news, about the financial impact on hospitals um, and that is, that is true. Uh, is there a way that I can help support the work that you're doing? Dr. Kim, do you want to talk about what that impact means from a financial and a research side, maybe? 
Sure. I mean, just, just for clarity's sake, we're still going to do what we need to do from uh, in the day-to-day in caring for our patients, irrespective of anything that has to do with financials. We, we care about uh, the patients and, and, and trying to cure their disease. Where it impacts us probably the most is in the context of uh, uh, pursuing research in, the, uh, in thoracic surgery and thoracic oncology. Uh, and I'll, you know, the university put a uh, moratorium initially on uh, going into the labs, doing research, that sort of stuff. And just now, as we try to come out of the uh, uh, curve being flattened, or who knows if it's even flat anymore, um, there's a return to that work. But uh, there's that, there was that limitation. Uh, and then on the front end, there's the, uh, the limitation of just, you know, having the resources to pursue that type of work. And so, uh, there, there was a double sort of whammy, if you will, and 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 because of that, uh, we were uh, uh, we were a little hamstrung in in terms of our ability to uh, to pursue research of any sort, for that matter, and, and and rightfully so. The university has been very proscriptive in this regard, and and we, you know, as being a high level, high caliber academic institution, uh, we play by the rules, and it's been it's important that we do so. And so, um, I think in that way. Um, the COVID has affected us in our ability to to do some of the research and, and having the resources for that. But uh, you know, any 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 bit helps uh, because uh, the the group of us here are all interested in advancing the science behind what we do. I, I really appreciate you saying that. And and if you don't mind, I may put on my uh, development side of my my hat here and just. What I try to let people know is that this is a, an incredibly strong institution. It's got the brightest minds here. You're going to get the highest level of care when you come to Keck Medicine of USC. But there is, you know, there are a lot of people who are supporting um, our efforts in COVID, which is, in fact, very important. But then again, it really has meaning when there's somebody who maybe wants to make a gift to support the division of thoracic surgery and support that research so we can continue on because even gifts like that, they have a direct impact on where COVID has uh, has taken a toll a little bit. I mean, we'll take a little bit of ramping up before we get back to to where we were. So there is a person on my team, her name is Katie McCorkle. She can be reached directly. Um, I'll put a slide up at the end so you can see uh, how to reach her and also, how to make an appointment with any one of these guys. It's um, telemedicine or in person. Um, and if there's anything, just in closing, that that this group of esteemed surgeons wants to share, or if there's any parting words, um, would love to hear them. And, um, and hopefully we can keep asking these questions as, as time goes on and, and invite this group back to, uh, as we learn more, talk about it more, um, share some successes and see what we've learned. You know, I, I just want to add one piece, which is um, we have been the, on the recipient side of an incredible amount of generosity from uh, several organizations, several individuals, uh, not just financially, but also in the support of us and when, when, during the sort of uh, early peak of this uh, COVID crisis. Um, the you just the food donations alone, uh, and, and I'm not one to miss a meal, uh, was was really um, was really incredible and really generous. So um, for those or to those who have already helped the clinical mission as well as the research mission and the mission just in general to to get us better as a whole, we are so uh, deeply appreciative of that, and we will continue to be deeply appreciative. I would echo that. I've had numerous patients, you know, send an email or call just to see how we are doing, our whole team is doing. And, and, you know, that's been very, very nice um, just to have that communication, expressing gratitude for the care they received, but also, um, you know, showing concern for us and how this is affecting us personally and also our, our newer patients, the ones who are actively being treated. And, you know, along the research lines, it's going to be really interesting to see how what we learn about COVID impacts the way that we take care of our lung surgery and esophageal surgery patients because there's so much overlap in some of the disease pathologies. Um, so there's, there's some novel things that are being done with COVID patients 
such as the way that they're positioned in bed and stuff to help them breathe, which are probably in the future going to be applied to, you know, our post-operative patients. And there's an opportunity to study those things. So I think there's, this is a, a incredible, incredible time to learn about lung disease and lung surgery. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has been a real pleasure um, connecting with you guys and, and everybody out there who's watching, we appreciate you being here with us and um, we will, we will sign off and there's a way to reach us on the screen to follow. Thanks you guys. Thank you. Can I just, can I just add one thing? Absolutely. We are fighting as one for you, and we will always fight on. Fight on. Fight on.